You're listening to the first episode of the HSS podcast. My name is Kalein Jans, strategic analyst with the Hague Center for Strategic Studies and your host. Feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes and follow us on SoundCloud. Today we're talking to Cyprien de Jong and Willem Oosterveld, both analysts with HSS who focus on Eurasian security and the geopolitics of the greater Middle East. You can find out more about them and myself on our website, hss.nl, or via our Twitter handle, at hssnl. News emerged last week that the EU is planning to strengthen the vetting of foreign investment. Specifically, Brussels will call for a more rigorous screening of foreign takeovers of European companies, as it seeks to address mountain concerns about a surge of Chinese investment into the bloc's high-tech manufacturing, energy and infrastructure sectors. This initiative does not come out of the blue, as already for a number of years China has been increasing its outward investments in rolling out its so-called 21st century Silk Road. This initiative, also called One Belt One Road Initiative, includes over $900 billion in planned investments of infrastructure across Asia, the Middle East and Central and Eastern Europe. It is the cornerstone of China's outward strategy. In today's podcast, we will discuss the rationale behind China's new Silk Road initiative, as well as a look at the geopolitical and economic impact it will have on Europe and the Middle East. So, Cyprien, what exactly is behind China's idea to revitalize the Silk Road from ancient times? What is driving leadership in Beijing? Uh, Well, several things, really. So, first and foremost, you have to understand that the prime reason as to why China is expanding overseas, uh, well not literally that is, but uh, in terms of sending its companies abroad is because it has a large chunk of industrial overcapacity. So rather than having these companies sit, well partially idle, it's preferred that they find foreign markets for their products and services to expand. Uh, one of the key reasons obviously is is that if you have idle capacity, uh, inadvertently it will lead to some kind of unemployment, which is of course in a one-party state is the one thing you kind of want to avoid. At the same time, it's not only domestic concerns, really, it's also foreign policy priorities and geopolitics that um, come to mind. For the Chinese, one of their main concerns is their over-reliance on certain transport corridors, particularly maritime ones, uh, that pass through various uh, choke points, such as the Malacca Straits as well as the Strait of Hormuz. Particularly the latter one has a large U.S. naval presence, something that the Chinese are not particularly thrilled about. So they wish to create this massive land corridor that goes all the way through Central Asia via the Middle East towards uh, Europe as a, as a kind of a counterweight to this, this dominance of uh, the U.S. in the Persian Gulf. All right, so it's a mix of domestic and economic concerns that intertwine with geopolitical foreign policy concerns in China. What are exactly the security implications of this massive increase in Chinese investment abroad? Well, if you look at the kind of sectors that they're investing in, so you see mostly it's infrastructure related. So either, for example, energy infrastructure could be you know real tangible infrastructure in the sense of bridges and ports, airports, etc., etc. So most of it deals with the creation of transport corridors to enable construction. So to enable these Chinese companies to actually go and build these things, um, they issue lavish sums of money to recipient countries. This in and of itself need not be entirely bad, if not for the fact that a lot of these countries are already heavily indebted. If you add to this that many of these nations have uh, current account deficits, uh, it means that if they were to experience some kind of uh, economic setback uh, or you know, worse economic period, it will be quite difficult for them to, to actually repay these loans, particularly if these projects that are actually being built do not necessarily live up to the expectations that these countries had. One has to bear in mind that for most of these countries, what they're effectively looking for are greenfield investments that actually create jobs and raise uh, domestic exports. Now, most of the projects that China is investing in actually do not do that. They're interesting for the Chinese, but not necessarily for the host countries, at least not up to the point that they're likely to be very profitable. So fast forward, you engage financial difficulties. Look at Venezuela, for example. I mean, there's, there's ample precedent for this kind of stuff. So the Venezuelans have attracted a lot of foreign credit in the last uh, few years. The vast majority of that came from China. These were hard commercial loans. For the Chinese also, they understood that Venezuela is a risk to invest in. And now faced with you know, years of years of mismanagement and the price of oil, that's half of what it was in 2014. Obviously, the Venezuelans have a problem, but the Chinese, uh, they do not budge. They don't wish to renegotiate the terms. Now, one of the regions targeted by the Chinese initiative is the Middle East. Willem, could you elaborate on what the strategic, political and economic implications are for the Middle East region? 
are Chinese investments an issue to these countries? Well, obviously they are an issue uh, in the sense that, I mean, they allow some of the countries actually sort of diversify their economies. I mean, if you look in particular at Iran is a very good example, but also Saudi Arabia. Uh, part of this uh, has been sort of prompted by important geopolitical changes. I mean, first of all, of course, uh, the Russians becoming more involved. The uh, Americans start to sort of disengage a little bit. The Chinese actually do provide a new economic dimension within the region, which is, of course, not without reason. I mean, as uh, Simon was already saying, I uh, mentioned the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which is very important because the primary reason why the Chinese are interested in the region from an economic point of view is that uh, they... Uh, import a lot of uh, fossil fuels uh, from the from the region. But what you also see is that whilst they're rolling out the, the Silk Road, uh, the Obor initiative, uh, that their portfolio is also being broadened. It's not just like uh, some of the infrastructure projects that they are involved in, uh, building ports, etc., uh, railways in various countries. But what you also see is that, that in terms of trade, the Chinese are actually uh, quite a significant player, something that not everyone is necessarily aware of. But if you sort of look at uh, some of the examples, I mean, for instance, they are the second largest trading partner already for Saudi Arabia and uh, for the UAE. Uh, they happen to be the biggest for Iran, but also for Iraq, for Pakistan, Oman. Uh, what you also see, interestingly, is that they are also very deeply involved in uh, countries such as, uh, such as Syria and uh, Yemen, where I mean, other investors have obviously uh, 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 disengaged themselves from, but the Chinese have stayed on the ground, also giving them some extra, some extra uh, uh, influence and leverage and this is what sort of brings us to the security dimension because one of the interests the Chinese obviously have is to try to stabilize or, or rather to keep the region stable in order for their investments and their economic interests to, to flourish. So at one point they will also have to become politically or uh, security wise engaged. And this is sort of where the Chinese are now facing a conundrum, where it's almost inevitable that they will have to do this. Uh, you see that in terms of military engagement, they have now built a base in, in Djibouti, for instance, close to the Bab el Mandab, which is another one of those choke points. But at the same time, of course, also with all the, the dossiers that you see, in particular the, the war in Syria, the standoff that you see right now around Qatar, this is also something that the Chinese will have to play a role in. And so basically what they want to do at this point is to try to not pick any particular side. So they want to try to stay neutral as much as they can. Uh, but what you will see is that, of course, as I was saying, uh, some of the countries in the region also trying to diversify. So they will also try to sort of play a little bit of divide and conquer with some of the uh, some of the outside parties, uh, including the Chinese. So the Chinese will also have to make some choices. Uh, so they will have to uh, uh, get their hands dirty. How the Chinese are going to respond to this and what the outcomes of this will be as of now uh, remains somewhat unclear. Looking closer to home, uh, Sibren, what exactly are the concerns for Europe regarding Chinese investments and foreign takeovers? What are the concerns in the region, but also perhaps to uh, mm -hmm. the concerns that are in Brussels? Well, twofold actually, or rather threefold. So on the one hand, when you speak about takeovers, then the obvious prime concern and also one of the reasons, the most tangible reason as to why uh, Brussels is considering tabling this legislation is uh, technology transfer and intellectual property theft. If the Chinese are seen as getting a controlling stake, for example, in, in strategic industries in, in Europe, then the obvious concern is that some of the key technology is going to flow back to China and, and we risk either losing our, our edge in these industries, uh, you know, with all kinds of industrial secrets and so on. So, so that's, that's one concern. But if you take a bit of a more regional perspective and you zoom out, some of the problems actually manifest themselves more in, let's say, EU candidate states. Um, if you look at the Western Balkans, for example, so some of the concerns that have already risen to the surface are whether or not EU standards and rules and regulations concerning public procurement, for example, environmental standards, also social rights, etc., are respected when it comes to these investments being made by uh, China. One example is the Budapest-Belgrade high-speed railway, which the well suspicion now is that it has fallen foul of public procurement rules. The thing at play here mainly is, is that from the EU's perspective, the main sort of carrot that has been dangled in front of you know, prospective countries has always been membership. And, and now already for a number of years, we see this, this, this trend whereby talks of membership are being put off. Uh, it's not only in the Western Balkans, it's also, of course, in former Soviet countries the case the less and less that becomes a realistic goal or attainable goal for these countries, the more and more they are also going to be looking elsewhere. And then the lure of this sort of quick money, be it from China, be it from Russia, be it from Turkey, in various different shapes and forms, 
will represent some kind of a, a threat to the cohesion and coherence within within Europe. So for the EU, it's it's high time that uh, it really revisits the message that it wishes to send to this part of the world. Otherwise, you risk undoing uh, a decade of work of convergence of laws, which you know the prime idea behind that was that there's a greater compatibility of uh, these countries so that they can eventually join. Another concern is more political when you look at inside the European Union, for example, that of course if there's a lot of money pouring into EU member states, possibly some of these states will be reluctant when it is necessary to internationally take a stand against China, for example on the South China Sea. Last year, December 2016, we saw that there were some smaller EU member states, for example, such as Hungary and Greece, that were more reluctant to issue a condemnation of the Chinese activities in the South China Sea. So this, obviously, you can draw some parallels with countries having good business ties with Russia, etc., etc. It will always complicate your ability to to act in, in unison when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, but the main concern here, from my view, is, is more the former rather than, than, than this one. So it, re- it really is about whether or not we are able to tie countries that wish to join the European Union to us, rather than see them look uh, to other countries that may have less benign goals. To the both of you, to conclude, what in a nutshell should Europe do in dealing with the issues you raise, yet at the same time ensure that it keeps good relations with China and China as an economic partner? Well, I think one of the things is that basically uh, the Europeans should try to essentially stick to its own values-based economic model. I mean, we have uh, quite an elaborate uh, legislation in this area in terms of investment, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Also, if you look at you know how we deal uh, with the United States, if you look at how we deal uh, with the Russians, we're able to hold firm. I don't see why we're not able to do it with China. Also, sort of keeping in mind that, that uh, China likes to sort of pride itself on being sort of a rule-abiding country. They also have an interest in being seen as a constructive international partner, a country that does play by the rules. I mean, uh, within the, the UN, for instance, you know, they emphasize this time and time again. If you look at, let's say, investment rules that have been enshrined within uh, WTO legislation, I mean, this is, of course, has been a perennial issue for 10, 20 years. So all of these things give China, one would think, an interest to play as much as possible by the rules that are being set, not just by the European Union, uh, but also internationally. One of the things, of course, which you can do is, for instance, agree a sort of a code of conduct uh, with the Chinese. So it doesn't have to be necessarily sort of binding legislation, but what you do is you try to sort of appeal to their reputation. And the fact that uh, upholding their reputation internationally is something that they value very highly. Uh, They don't want to be seen to be uh, skirting the rules or so. So I think this would be, you know, one way to sort of create a framework in order to create sort of a more uh, level playing field and to create a, uh, a constructive, uh, forward-looking uh, platform to deal with the Chinese in the future. Yeah, I mean, you, you raise a number of valid points there. So to tie into this, I think the proposal that's, that's been, uh, been circling uh, now already for some time on, on, on vetting uh, investments from foreign countries, I think is a good step in the right direction, primarily because as I highlighted, these problems with sticking to EU procurement rules, social standards, environmental standards, etc., etc., this is very important to make sure that there is such a thing as a level playing field. If you bend the rules, it may seem like this is is in your interest in the short term for your own country, but it does mean that you create an environment of unfair competition for others. So in this respect, I do hope that the uh, European governments uh, move forward with this proposal and uh, try not to water it down very, very much. Another thing that the EU really should be doing is, and uh, well, I mean, I've, I've said it before in, in more detail, but it really is uh, a critical assessment, again, of the kinds of appeal or the, the meaning that being part of an EU accession process really, really entails. It's the only sort of really, really strong thing that the EU has to shape its immediate neighborhood. And this is not only in Western Balkans, this is also in North Africa, this is Eastern Mediterranean, this is for former Soviet countries, all of them. Unless you you go back to this tool, this instrument, and you revitalize it, it will simply mean that your influence in your immediate neighborhood will go down. Thank you, Sipan and Willem, for being with us. Um, For further analysis, please take a look at our new report on the geoeconomic implications of China's new Silk Road. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this one, follow us on our social media channels. And stay tuned for our next podcast episode on countering Russian disinformation and societal interference.